Let's face it, in our busy lives, we don't eat enough fruits and vegetables. In fact, according to the CDC, only 1 in 10 Americans are eating the recommended daily amount of fruits and vegetables each day, missing out on essential vitamins, minerals, fibers, and antioxidants. And that's where Balance in Nature comes in. Balance in Nature sources only the best produce, free from pesticides, heavy metals, and harmful bacteria. And Balance in Nature is the best fruit and vegetable product on the market. They use only fresh whole fruits and vegetables inside each capsule. They don't use any GMOs, fillers, binding agents, or preservatives of any kind. You're getting real food, real science, real nutrition. I would never endorse a product that I don't use myself, and since using Balance in Nature, I feel more alert, I have more energy, my focus is sharper, and I feel great. Live life to the fullest and choose Balance in Nature. And guess what? PAS Report listeners can get 35% off the first preferred order. Start getting the recommended daily amount of fruits and vegetables you need by using code PAS at balanceofnature.com. Welcome to the PAS Report Weekly Roundup Podcast. The PAS Report provides an honest analysis on the critical issues that matter to you without the biased media filter. Here's your host, Professor Nicholas Giordano. What's up, everyone? Welcome to the PAS Report Podcast. I hope you enjoyed your weekend. And people are still talking about President Biden's dark and dangerous, disturbing speech. It was a stunning display, and I am thoroughly, thoroughly disgusted with this administration. But I'm going to talk about that on Wednesday, because on Wednesday's episode, it seems that there are so many who are ignoring the real story out there. Too many are ignoring the bigger picture that goes far beyond President Biden and former President Trump. What I will say, though, is who the hell approved the backdrop for the president's speech? It was reminiscent of a 1930s authoritarian state with blood red lights and the two Marines flanking the president. You would think that someone would have enough sense to say, hey, guys, the optics of this look really bad. We don't want the president looking like a tin pot dictator, so we may want to change the background here. That visual will live throughout the history books. And following the president's speech, I did write an article published in The Federalist laying out how the speech was two years in the making and how if the administration continues down this road, it ends badly for all of us. So I have the links up at the PAS report. I also wrote a piece for campus reform explaining how President Biden's vote buying scheme with student loan debt is a slap in the face to every person and family who did the right thing, who has been responsible So both the articles I have in the show notes of this episode on the PAS Report website, PASReport.com. And I want to get to today's guest because I'm bringing in author Vince Ellison. He's a remarkable person with a remarkable story from being born on a cotton plantation to working hard, overcoming obstacles, and becoming a successful author. He wrote the books The Iron Triangle, Inside the Liberal Democrat Plan to Use Race to Divide Christians in America in Their Quest for Power and How We Could defeat Defeat Them. And he also wrote 25 Lies, his newest book, exposing Democrats' most dangerous, seductive, damnable, destructive lies and how to refute them. He's a member of Project 21, written articles for numerous publications, and appeared on plenty of shows, including Tucker Carlson Tonight. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Before I bring in Vince, make sure you go to PASReport.com. You could sign up for the newsletter. You could check out the show notes. You want to share this episode with other people and click the follow button on this podcast so you never miss an episode of your PAS report. With that out of the way, I want to bring in Vince Ellison, author of 25 Lies. Vince, so glad you come to the PAS Report podcast. How are you today? Hey, man, I'm as happy as I can be. I'm happy to be with you. Thank you for having me. Well, I'm glad you could be on. There's a lot of craziness in the world. And what's your take on the current state of politics in the United States? We just had uh, President Biden last week come out and call about 50 percent of the country semi-fascist. And we're living in a time where the targeting of political opponents is obvious. Yeah, man, I've been around Democrats my whole life. I was born on a cotton plantation in Haywood County, Tennessee. My father was a sharecropper. Um They uh, kicked him off the cotton plantation when he was a young man because his father decided to register to vote. And I was raised uh, 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 in the South my whole life. These people, you know, educated me to work in the cotton fields and work in the factories, not to be a writer. But my father aspired. He made sure we got a good education. And now my family does very well. I wrote in my book, 25 Lies, there's a definitive statement where I say that the Democratic Party is the evilest organization in the history of the world. Um, This guy by the name of um, Whitman down at Yale wrote a book about how the racist policies of the Jim Crow South actually inspired the Nazis 
to write their Nuremberg laws. They came here to America and they studied what the Jim Crow South Democrats were doing to blacks and said, we want to do that to Jews. And their racism and their hatred has inspired so much evil, not just in America, but throughout the world. I mean, this is a party that castrates little boys and calls them little girls. They give, they, they, they give um, mastectomies to little girls and call them little boys. They trap children in failing schools. They abort them up. They want to abort them up to the ninth month. They allow fentanyl and sex trafficking to come over the borders and won't stop it. They disarm people in, 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 in war zones and refuse to protect them. Then they want to pull God out of the public square. This is an evil institution. And since their inception in 1800, they've killed over 100 million Americans in slavery and abortion clinics and through lynchings and murder. The Democratic Party has always been evil, and they continue to be evil even to this day. And I think a lot of people are catching on to that. Well, and you you bring up an interesting point because it it seems that Democrats forget their past history. They try and ignore their past history, and they try and tie what they did in the past to the entirety of the United States and the United States as an institution. And that's a myth. I mean, we had people fighting against slavery. Obviously, Abraham Lincoln as a Republican fought the Civil War. Mm -hmm. We had abolitionists from the Northeastern states for quite some time since the founding of this country in 1776. So Democrats continue to push these lies. And how damaging has it been to the minority communities? You hit it right on the head. They are good at deflecting their sins on the rest of the nation. And and even uh, because they have their minions in the press, these, these, these liberals, they want to rewrite history and tell everybody that this was American racism. It was not. Um, um, America has been fighting against the Democratic Party uh, since its inception. From 1800 to 1860, they were the party of slavery. From 1860 to 1865, the party of the Confederacy. From 1865 to 1970, they were the party of Jim Crow. The Ku Klux Klan was a military wing of the Democratic Party. Every Southern governor was a, was a segregationist governor, and he was a Democrat. Every uh, a senator, almost every congressman was a segregationist, and they hated black people. I mean, they maimed them, they killed them, they murdered them, they destroyed the black family. But here's the thing that they did, the most sinister thing they did was when they infiltrated the black church during the civil rights movement. And when they, you know, we, I, I listen to Thomas Sowell like you do, and I listen to uh, Walter Williams like you do, and they'll always say that the demise of the black community started in the 1960 when a welfare state decided to destroy the family. But what they fail to always say is that you cannot connect the welfare state to just Lyndon Johnson and the Democrat Party. You got to also connect it to the civil rights movement and Martin Luther King Jr. Um, uh, uh, It was Martin Luther King Jr. and his poor people's march that was behind a lot of what happened with the great society. Matter of fact, he was mad because Vietnam kept the government from doing more. That's why he was starting, that's why he was going to do the poor people's march. It was, it was Martin Luther King Jr. when um, uh, in his book, uh, Bearing the Cross, David Garrow said that when Moynihan was told by Johnson to take his, his findings in the Moynihan report, and, 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 and Moynihan told Johnson that, there, that, that, that if we keep doing welfare the way we're doing it, it will destroy the black family. And we have to take the, the money from government and apply it to putting the black man back in charge of his family. Lyndon Johnson said, take this to King and to the civil rights community. I mean, George Bundy, who was of the Ford Foundation and witnessed what happened, said it was a wonder that Moynihan got out of that room alive. And that, and that they, they called him a racist, cussed him out, told him that they were trying to, they wanted to destroy the family. The family was a, 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 was a relic of slavery. And what they did, they demanded that LBJ put the man in house clause into welfare. And, and instead of uh, you but putting the black uh, father back in charge of his family, the man in house clause said, if you call a black man in the family, you were supposed to cut him off from welfare. And in one generation, we went from 80% of black children being born into wedlock to 80% of it being born out of wedlock. And Martin Luther King Jr.'s fingerprints were all on it. And we failed to talk about this. We failed to talk about our part in this. We failed to talk about the fact that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to take over the black church. For, the, for, for these liberals, he ended up getting excommunicated from the Black church, from the National Baptist Convention, and he started his own sect of the Baptist Convention called the Progressive National Baptist Convention. This is the sect that Raphael Warnock belongs to. So King was so radical in, 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 in his concept of using the church to press a political philosophy that he basically now has made the Black church just a conduit to the Democrat Party. And now we've become a dysfunctional culture 
because the one thing that kept us in line, and that was our belief in Jesus Christ, our belief in church and family, was disintegrated by the Great Society, the Civil Rights Movement, Martin Luther King Jr., and until we go back to that point and undo what we've done, we will never be successful in America. Well, I think you bring up an amazing point that no one really talks about, and and that's the strength of the Black Church as an institution uh, since the founding of this country that uh, helped the Black community actually grow and thrive. I mean, if you go into Black communities in the late 1800s, early 1900s, families were together, employment, they had their own businesses, the Black communities, they were thriving, they were they were gaining success. And then we started to see the black communities move out of the South and go into the inner city regions, Chicago's, Mm -hmm. uh, New York cities. And it all fell apart under the Democrat control of these areas. Right. I mean, that's where we see it. And you're right. The decimation of the black family is something that has to be spoken about. Nobody wants to talk about it, but it should be spoken about. But now it's not just the black family. Right. I mean, we're seeing this. In Hispanic families, we're seeing it yes. in white families. Yes. We're seeing more right. and more children born out of mm-hmm. wedlock. Mm-hmm. We're seeing this attack and assault on the idea of faith. Why are they trying so hard to push faith out of a public square? They're Marxists, and in the Marxist ideology, the state is everything. In the American concept of freedom, our freedom comes from God, and that the government has no right to contradict that freedom. According to John Locke, Our freedom comes from God is irreversible, non-transferable, and unsellable. That's why Thomas Jefferson called it uh, uh, the call-out rights unalienable. They did not come from man. They did not come from government. They came from God. And governments are instituted, according to our declaration, to help us secure these rights. And that when they fail to do that, we are to abolish that government. It is our duty to abolish it because the government is here to help us protect our rights given to us from God in a Marxist concept of government. Nothing is over the state. So to believe in God puts God over the state and they can't have that because you can say as an individual, I'm not going to do that because it goes against my conscience. And we will, and and based upon our declaration, if a government does that, we're supposed to exchange that government. We're supposed to abolish it. In Marxism, you can't have that. You can't say God is over government, families over government, that because my God said, I can't do this, I'm not going to do it. And if you try to make me do it, we are going to run all you guys out of office and probably kill all of you. The Marxists can't have that. So in order for them to have absolute power, they must destroy God. And the Democrats have been trying to do that, oh man, ever since the 60s. Uh, I, I, I've been doing a lot of studying on the civil rights movement, a lot of studying on where Martin Luther King Jr. and the Civil Rights Movement took Black people. Every solution they had to the problems of America was a government solution. These men were theologians. They were trained specifically to heal the soul and to heal the heart. They were trained to say, if I'm not getting along with my brother, I'm supposed to go to my brother and talk to him and change his mind and change his heart. Instead, the Civil Rights Movement says, we're going to go to government and have the government put a gun to their head. And tell them that if you don't let us be with you, we will kill you or put you in jail. That's called stalking. Because of that, we have never, ever, ever settled this problem. Harvard did a story to say the schools are more segregated now than they were before Brown versus Board of Education. They did another study that said that the Black community and white community are more segregated now than they were before the Civil Rights Movement. Why? Because we didn't deal with the heart. See, this is what you do. If you're dealing like a Christian, you go to the person and you say, hey, man, uh, can I eat at your restaurant? They say no. You say, well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to build a restaurant and my food is going to be better than yours and you can come eat at my restaurant for free. That's how you change his heart. If you ask the guy, say, can my child go to school with yours? He says no. You say, well, I'm going to build a better school than yours and you can come and send your child to my school for free. My job is to love you. I'm not supposed to be concerned about how you feel about me. Martin, Martin, Martin Luther King Jr. said that, uh, you know, I was wondering why these young men were kneeling, Kaepernick and all of them. And I went to the Lorraine Motel and I saw a speech by King. King said that uh, 100 years after the Emancipation Proclamation, you know, his and and I have a dream speech. He said, 100 years after the Emancipation Proclamation, the Negro is still not free. That is a lie. I was born free. King said he had a dream one day that he will not be judged by the content. His children won't be judged by the content of their character, by the color of their skin. Well, I don't have a problem being judged by the content of my character, but what's wrong with the color of my skin? I'm a black man. See, you don't want to be judged by something you're ashamed of. And he started a retrogression in the minds of Black people, but also he gave a sinister concept of white superiority to the white liberals. 
and made them believe that it was their responsibility to take care of us like we were some type of a child with a, with that, 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 that's learning disabled, that we're their responsibility. And they cannot do this for us. Larry King was telling a story. He was asked by Frank Lutz, what was his, uh, out of all the interviews he gave, what was his favorite interview? Lutz said, uh, it was Martin Luther King Jr. in 1961. And uh, Frank Lutz said, what is he doing? He said, well, King was integrating a hotel down in Tallahassee, Florida. And I was called as a young reporter to come cover it. King walked in, asked the guy for a room. The clerk told him no. And King said, well, I want my room. The clerk said, no. He said, now look, man, you got to go. And King said, no, I'm not going to go. And he said, well, what do you want? King said, I want my dignity. Now, I hate that story because it implies that some two-bit white clerk can take away my dignity. Martin Luther King Jr. was the most powerful black man in America, yet he let a two-bit minimum wage white clerk take away his dignity. God gave me my dignity. You can't take it from me. And since that time, we've been going to white America asking them to do something for us that they cannot do. We've attributed to them powers that belong only to God. And we've uh, contributed to government those same powers. That power is the power to free us. No, you can't free us. Give us our dignity. No, you can't give us our dignity. It's ours. It's like your skin, your hair, your, 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 your hands. You only need activated. But we've been told by our leadership, and especially by the Democratic Party, we are not free. We have no dignity. And our best and our brightest leaders among us now, the people that the Black community and the Democrat elevate, call us the worst names in the world. They call us the N-word. Bitches, hoes, thugs. Who does it come from? The guys they had seen at the Super Bowl this past, this past year. Guys that Barack Obama invited to the White House. People that Joe Biden allowed to interview him like Cardi B and all that stuff. And now, how can you bring up people up and elevate them when the people that call them the worst names in the world are elevated in front of the world and called heroes? They have to believe that is true. No other race in the world allows such terrible, terrible things to happen to them. And the Democratic Party celebrated, they elevated, and they have no plans to change it. We've all been there before. You want to get someone the perfect gift for the perfect occasion, but you have no idea what to get. Well, you don't have to rack your brain anymore. Gift baskets are perfect for any occasion, whether it's birthdays, holidays, corporate events, or a simple thank you. At designeryselfgiftbaskets.com, you get to choose the theme and the products that go into the basket. You have a coffee lover? Try the K-Cup basket. You're looking for something special for the person that loves to barbecue? No problem. There's a basket for it. Make every basket unique to the person you're sending it to. And if you're in a rush and don't have time to customize the gift basket, it's not an issue because at DIYGB.com, you can choose from hundreds of prearranged baskets based on the occasion, theme, or recipient. And PAS Report listeners get 10% off using code PAS at checkout. So go to DIYGB.com, find the perfect gift for the perfect occasion, and use coupon code PAS at checkout to get 10% off your order. Visit DIYGB.com today. Well, no, even worse than that, they've took, taken it a step further where they've institutionalized it throughout multiple systems, whether it's education, whether it's the workforce, no matter where you go, everything today is based on the color of your skin and where you come from. And we see it in curriculums throughout the United States where you have these critical race theory and they also use diversity, equity and inclusion mm -hmm. because critical race theory has negative connotations now where they push this idea that the color of your skin determines who you are as a person determines yeah. whether you're good or bad, whether you're an oppressor or you're oppressed, whether you're a victimizer or a victim. Mm -hmm. And we're now pushing that. And as government has grown bigger, our lives have become more complicated. They haven't solved any problems. They've only created new problems. And if we look at a lot of the inner cities and the urban areas, we see that people's lives are far worse off today. I mean, it seems we lost our mind over the course of the last three years where the ones that caused the problem in society are getting a free pass and the innocent victims are the one that have to act as prisoners in their own homes. They can't leave their homes to walk down the street out of fear that they're going to be stabbed, shot, punched in the face and knocked out. And this is all happening in Democrat cities throughout the country. So where is the black community and other communities pushing back against this? I mean, their lives have gotten dramatically worse in these inner cities. And yet the vote still goes in a large portion to the Democrats. So, well, uh, well the, the, a whole lot of this has to do with the fact that the Republican Party won't go down there and, and, and do any business with them. Uh -huh. There's this old, this old Volbillion term says 90% uh, of any gig is just showing up, just showing up. 
Give uh, give 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 Al Sharpton with his with his no good greasy behind. Give him a uh, give him credit. He shows up. You know, in the 1980s or the 1990s, would you ever have suspected that Al Sharpton would have been the so-called leader of the civil rights movement? I mean, come on, the fact that he's the most terrible human being to ever walk the face of the earth is Al Sharpton. Oh, he, Jesse Jackson. I have this great chapter in my book that says um, there's a lie that claims that civil rights leaders were all moral. They were they were not moral. You you've heard about the tapes that David Garrett found about King and the stuff he was doing with the orgies and whatnot, and the money he was being given by. Uh, um, uh, uh, the communists and that the you know Stanley Levinson and Bayard Rustin and and uh, Hunter Pitts O'Dell these communists were involved in his organization wrote his speeches did everything for him. These guys were not the best of us. They are the worst of us. And in 1992, when Lee Atwater took over the the uh, party, well he didn't take over the party. He became he became chairman of of the RNC. He had to deal with he had to deal with redistricting. And he wanted, and we, and, and, and the Republicans had not uh, had control of the House in about 40 years. So what Lee Atwater did, he said, let's go to the Black caucuses in the state houses, and we're going to make them a deal. We're going we're gonna to pack all the Black people into these majority Black districts, and we're going to double their numbers in their state houses, and we're going to also give them a majority Black congressman in these districts. But they'll have to sign off on our redistricting plan to get this. This redistricting plan left Left the the, uh, the 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 GOP with, the, with 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 these very very white districts that were more apt to vote Republican, and all the black people were in these majority black districts that were more apt to vote Democrat. Just so happened, Lee Atwater's plan worked. The black Democrats said, "Yeah, we'll do it." Here was the caveat: you can never ever help any Republican that runs against us in our majority black districts ever again. And they made that deal. So it was like the middle passage in reverse. The Republicans sold black people to black Democrats. And they have, and I don't care who you are, I don't care how smart you are, if you run for Congress or run against one of those delegates in these majority black districts, the Republican Party will not give you a dime. They don't care if you're black, they don't care if you're white. You get no help. So since 1992, 1992, the black community hasn't heard a Republican message since. It's good, but it's good politics. Because in 1994, the GOP took over the House. That's when Newt Gingrich became Speaker of the House. And since that time, the GOP has had the House 22 years, and the Democrats have had it only eight. So when, you, so when we ask, are the Republicans going to change this? No, because they've just done it again. They just went back. They did the redistricting plans. They got their majority of black districts. And they're going to take over the House again, presumably, in 2022 at the end of this year. So this is good politics, but it's bad policy. And the black community is suffering. And this is why I write in my book, the only thing that's going to change this is for the church, the real church, black and white people to have an intervention and go into the black community and say, we're going to have to deal with this. Because just like what Andrew Breitbart said, politics is downstream of culture. The culture changes the politics. In the black community, the politics is changing the culture. And that's ass backwards. You're supposed to change your culture. And this is where Christianity comes in. This is where the church comes in. This is where the, 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 the upper middle class people, black and white, who are doing very well, go back to the ghettos and say, it's time for us to go back and get the lost sheep again. And we need to go and start doing that. And this is why my main goal, I'm not really involved in the, the political side of this. I'm more involved in the cultural side of it. I expose the political to let people know that you are wasting your time with it. Because too many of them are benefiting from it. This has to come from the family, from the people that care, from the people that love you. They're the ones that have to go back down there and start going into the black community, start going to the black restaurants, the black church. Why well, won't a upper middle class white church get in their bus and go fellowship with white Christians down in the ghetto, black Christians in the ghetto? This is how you solve the problem. And we have to be proactive in that. And that's what I write about. And it's another great point that you're bringing up when we examine it and we understand it. The Republicans surrendered these areas long ago to the Democrats. Yes. They ignored these areas. They gave the people nothing to vote for. And, and, you know, you would think you put together a plan over a number of years. You go into the community enough, you start peeling away 5% of the vote, maybe 6% of the vote, and then it changes. But you just brought up the churches. Haven't the churches themselves become political animals, and a lot of these uh, preachers from the pulpit push politics in a sense. I mean, I know that when I go to my church, especially when we look at things like the coronavirus, 
the churches just blindly accepted everything the government said, and they determined when, where, and how we could practice our faith. And you didn't see anyone in church leadership, with the exception of a few, stand up against the government and say, no, 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 we have the First Amendment. We are the ones that dictate when we can practice our faith, where we're going to practice our faith, how we're going to practice our faith. So haven't the church leaders, aren't many of them moral cowards who won't speak up against the authority of the state? Oh, yes. I, 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 you're exactly right. You know, the black church, well, we know about that. That's That's been going for the last 40, 50 years with, with, with all this black liberation theology and all this. But also the church in general. And this, this is why when we talk about the church, we're not talking about the leadership. We're talking about the people. When we start dealing with the church in the theory that Jesus Christ talked about, he talked about the body of Christ. And those are the members that believe in him, not a minister, not a preacher. As a matter of fact, he didn't have much good to say about preachers. Uh, whenever he talked about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he kind of went off on them. He called them a generation of vipers, liars. You know, he just tore them apart. He also said there'd be false prophets coming in his name. And when his uh, disciples asked, how do we know them? He said, you will know them by their fruits. He said, you will not get good fruit from a rotten tree, a bad fruit from a good tree. He said, the fruit and the tree will be after his own. So when you look at the black community and the condition that it's in, the black pastor can be uh, declared a false prophet because of the condition of the fruit. He is a bad tree. tree. His, the, the condition of the people verify that he's a false prophet. And when you look at the condition of these congregations, you'll find out who the false prophets are. There's some good ones out there, but the people that know, the people, people like you and me, I don't have to wait for a preacher to tell me what to do. You don't. You're a strong man. We know what we have to do. We have to go down and start talking to our Christian brothers and sisters. We have to start going to church with them. We have to start visiting their restaurants. We have to start uh, um, uh, 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 volunteering and coaching their children in Little League and in baseball. We need to go to a single mother that has no father in the house and say, hey, does Johnny want to play football? Yes, I got a team for him. Is he having problems in math? Yes, I can help him. This is what we're supposed to do. This is what, and Jesus said, take this gospel and spread it, starting here first in Jerusalem and Samaria, and then to the other most parts of, 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 of the world. He said, handle home first. So we want to spread the gospel in Africa and Asia, but in Chicago, we don't want to cross the street and go to the ghetto and talk to our brothers and sisters in the same city. And that's why we have to lock our doors. That's the reason why we, 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 we have to carry guns. That's the reason why we have to have a gun on every floor of our house. Because we have, we, we, we've made our society dysfunctional because we will not share the gospel and we will not live it in front of the people that need it. Now, are you, do you think people are waking up and we're starting to see a turnaround? Or do you think that it's going to get worse before it gets better? I think we're at a tipping point. I think shows like yours when, and, and people that write like me when we converse like this, people that are seeking the truth will find it. Uh, the gospel teaches us Jesus Christ never ran anybody down. They all came to him. He would put himself in a position to be seen and heard, and he would wait. And whoever was seeking the truth, they would come. Right here, shows like yours, when you have writings like mine, when I go on TV, when uh, uh, I'm, I'm on the radio, we are putting it out there. And just like you found it, and I found it, People that seek the truth will find it. And for people that don't want it, it's nothing you can do for them, for them. And it's a shame, but I know that to be true. C.S. Lewis said hell is a choice. It is. Uh, and when I first read that, I asked the question, what is C.S. Lewis talking about? How can hell be a choice? But I see it every day. The person that's morbidly obese, and when you ask them to go to the gym, they won't go. They're choosing hell. The person that's on drugs and alcohol, they won't go to rehab, choosing hell. The person that's stuck or the, 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 or, or, or the, the, the woman that's stuck with a, with a husband that beats her every day is choosing hell. Just like you can choose to go to hell, you can choose not to. God said in the Bible, he said, I lay before you, let heaven bear witness that I lay before you blessings and curses, life and death. Choose life so that you and your children shall live. This is all the choice. In our Bible at the beginning, in, in Genesis 3, Cain was angry because God had rejected his offering but had accepted the offering of his brother Abel. And God talked to Cain, his grandson, and said, Cain, why are you angry? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if not, sin waits at the door to master you, but you must master it. Listen to what God told Cain. If you do well, will you not be accepted? You and I have lived long enough to see that everyone that does well is accepted. Joe Lewis was accepted. 
back in the 1930s and 40s, a black man. He knocked out Max Melling in New York City and all of America loved him and told, called him a hero. Uh, uh, Owens was accepted when he went to Nazi Germany and, and just obliterated Hitler. He got a ticket tape parade in New York City in the 1930s. Jackie Robinson accepted. Muhammad Ali accepted. Tim Cook, openly gay, oh, the biggest corporation in the world, can call the White House anytime, accepted. If you do well, you will be accepted. But the left wants to tell a lie. The Democratic Party wants to tell you that even if you do well, you won't be accepted. And that is a lie. So they tell you don't even try. They tell you that it's fixed. Give up. And when you believe that, you're done. And they have you as a slave. And that's who they are. They are liars. They are Marxists. They are evil. And everybody that boasts of them, you have to answer for it in front of God. And it's a great point. You keep uh, you give up, you're giving them power. That's all you're doing. Vince, I enjoyed the conversation. Everyone needs to read 25 Lies. I'll have all the links up at the PAS report. Thank you for joining me, Vince. Love the conversation. Hey, brother, it was my pleasure. Call me anytime. Great conversation with Vince, and he certainly provides value to the national conversation. Be sure to check out his books and follow Vince. I have the links up at the PAS Report website, PASReport.com. As for Wednesday, like I said at the beginning, there are too many who are completely missing what's really going on out there. They're not looking at the bigger picture and where this all goes. So make sure that you tune in. It will be an eye-opening and enlightening episode. I guarantee that. If you find the content of this podcast informative, please take 30 seconds to leave a five-star rating and write a review on Apple Podcasts. I want to thank you for joining me and I'll be back on Wednesday with another great episode of the PAS Report Podcast. Thank you for listening to the PAS Report Weekly Roundup Podcast. Podcast. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. Be sure to rate, share, and subscribe to the podcast so you'll never miss an episode. Also, visit PASReport.com and follow us on Twitter at PAS Report. 